All right, looks like we're live in here. So all that is good to go. I'm gonna get right into it, everybody. Welcome aboard. It's uh, Friday morning. That's why I got my Hawaiian shirt on because it's Aloha Friday. So we're gonna start off our, our Fridays with a little bit of Aloha. And today I wanna talk about uh, a couple different types of situational awareness. This is the threat detection group. If you don't know what I do or who I am, you know we talk about behavioral situational awareness and how to disrupt violence or impending a threat depending on the situation. But I wanna get a little bit broader and I wanna throw a little bit wider net today to see what type of situational awareness might actually apply to your life. We got a lot of different people in here. We have military and law enforcement and everybody in between. So I just wanna do a quick overview of uh, different types of it out there, all right? So the first one being is situational awareness for a pilot. You have airlines, you have pilots flying all over the place, and this is big in the pilot industry because they talk about situational awareness all the time. Well, what type of situational awareness does a pilot have to have, okay? So not only one, are you a plane moving three, 400 miles an hour through the air, you have hundreds and thousands of other, other planes out there moving different directions. You know, if you're driving on a car, that's kind of 2D. If you can go left or right, you're not gonna go up and you're not gonna go down. But when it's a pilot and you're an airplane, it's a complete 3D kind of threat environment. You, you could have uh, threats coming from any direction, any speed, you have no idea. So you have to have some type of visual reference to be able to observe for things coming in your area. So that's external threats, uh, external pilots. Birds. Whoa. Uh, but also you have to be situationally aware of what's going on inside your cockpit, all right? We've all seen those kind of instrument panels. There's hundred little switches and whatnot. You have to know where your instruments are, what your panels are doing, what your gauges are showing in, rela in relation to what you're seeing out there. Not only do you have to have that external kind of situational awareness, you have some internal situational awareness on, you know, what's the weather outside. You see us now? You should be able to see the field now. Let's say it's super dark and it's cloudy everywhere and it's rainy, I might only be able to use my instruments. So I might be getting some kind of inputs from the uh, outside that, hey, you need to pull up or you need to do this. When in reality, I have to look at my instruments and trust my instruments to go, no, that's not what, what's happening. Um, here's what's going on. If anybody remembers JFK Jr., he died. He had the whole Kennedy kind of um, uh, the the curse of the Kennedys and he died in a, a small plane crash and I think from I don't I don't know if they got the black box back from it but basically they concluded there was some type of human error so basically he's flying at nighttime he's flying in a situation where he's not rated it's too dark he doesn't trust his instrument panel he has a feeling he, he has a feeling like they're going down or maybe they're getting too close to the ground and he does something he doesn't listen to the instruments and he, and he crashes into the water. All right? That was a human factor. So definitely you have to have pilot situational awareness, not only internally, but externally with uh, other things out there. And what's crazy, when they train pilots, you know, a, a lot of the things they deal with is human factors, you know, humans making mistakes, you know, in an airplane, depending on the size and, and, and breadth of it is, there's so many redundancies in the airplane, you know, there's three or four levels of fail safe. So if you mess everything up, um, a crash doesn't happen. But within that, the pilots will call it Swiss cheese, all right? You have an issue that might be a really little kind of minor issue, but because that happened, this next little thing happened, and this next little thing happened, and now all of a sudden your problem turns into Swiss cheese, and then you throw a human mistake on top of that, and bad stuff happens. There was a flight, uh, this was years ago, it was an um, Air France flight, it crashed in the middle of the ocean, 228 lives lost, 228 souls aboard. And basically they got the black box out and figured out it was human error. What was happening was you have basically the veteran pilot, you had the kind of mid-level pilot, and then you had the new guy, junior pilot, all right? So normally all three of them are in the cockpit. It's an international flight. So the veteran pilot goes, hey, I'm gonna go get some rack time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to sleep in the cabin. He goes to sleep and it's the two guys in front there. Harry, you mind taking over while I hit the laugh? Sure thing, Rusty. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, and Rusty, mm -hmm. I want to thank you for going to bat for me last week. I was happy to do it. You know, just because corporate says you're too old to fly doesn't make it true. If anything, you're more qualified than us younger guys. It means a lot to me. Sure thing. Oh, and Rusty, mm -hmm. I want to thank you for going to bat for me last week. Yeah. 
they get into some turbulence, something bad happens, and basically the plane goes into a stall. It hasn't maintained enough airspeed going forward, and it starts to stall out and do one of these numbers where now it's instead of a plane, it's not aerodynamic and it's starting to fall. So day one, pilot school, when they teach you how to fly planes, what do you do in a stall? A hey, nose down. You nose down, cut throw, nose down, or I'm, I'm sorry, just nose down. I'm not a pilot, so don't take any of my advice if you're in a bad situation. Evan, listen to me. When I say I want you to retract the flaps, retract the gear, trim us nose down, okay? But everything's going to be opposite, so make sure you trim us nose down. But nose down, because when you put the nose down, remember you're stalling because of low airspeed, you nose down, you gather, yeah, you're going towards the ground, but you're getting up speed to pull you out of that stall, right? It's a simple maneuver for pilots that have practiced it, and it's like day one what they teach. These are airline pilots. They've had hundreds and thousands of hours of training. They know exactly what to do. The turbulence happens. They go into a stall. The, the mid-range guy, he knows what to do. He goes, stall, nose down, right? The new guy, for whatever reason, just flubs it in his head and goes, stall, I need to pull up. And he starts pulling up on the stick, okay? That type of aircraft, they had two kind of joysticks. If you push down on one and pull back on the other, what happens? The feedback cancels each other out. So the plane didn't do anything. One guy's pushing forward, one guy's pulling back, and the plane's just stalling out. The, they call it a bitchy Betty. It's a speaker in the back going altitude, pull up, stall, stall, yelling a stall warning. I think they estimated that stall warning um, yelled the stall warning 90 to 100 times. It was like a three or four minute period. All this chaos is happening. The plane's finally, the veteran um, pilot finally wakes up and runs in, goes, what the hell's going on? They're like, we're stalled out. Harry, you took us up to 60,000 feet. What are you doing? Oh, Rusty, I want to thank you for going to bat for me last week. And he's screaming at him, nose down, nose down. And But it was at that point, it was too late. They were too low, and they crashed right into the ground, okay? The simplest, simplest maneuver you can do to pull yourself out of stall, just go nose down. And for whatever reason, there was a Swiss cheese moment, and he forgot that. And all those people died just because of a human factor. Why I bring up this, this um, case study is that this applies in our lives because we put in these redundancies all over the place in three-layered and four-layered, but oftentimes... All it takes is one screw up. All it takes is one little human factor mistake and all of a sudden a lot of lives are lost. So definitely situational awareness in the airline sense and the pilot sense, that's good to go. And you also have other people like fire and EMS and law enforcement, they have to have their own situational awareness. And I talk about law enforcement and military and our situational awareness we have to maintain, but to talk about firemen, they have to have a different set of situational awareness, right? They have to take in a lot of factors happening around them. What their crew is doing, what the fire is doing, what the wind is doing, what you know other agencies are doing. So all these factors, they have to make life or death decisions very quickly. So it's not necessarily the behavioral profiling I'm talking about, but they have to take a lot of observable indicators real quick and process, you know? And uh, there's a great story from the the Malcolm Gladwell book called Blink, you know, and a lot of people have done this case study where they look at uh, fire chiefs. And there was one case study where a fire chief, they're responding to a kitchen fire. Okay, that was the call that went out over the radio. Hey, it's a kitchen fire. This chief has been to a thousand kitchen fires in his life. All right, he has file folders. He knows what they feel like. He knows what they sound like. All right. He gets on the ground and his fireman, his squad starts getting in the hallway. They're hosing down the hallway, making their way to the fire in the kitchen. And he's moving with them. They get into the kitchen and he kind of, they break the plane of the kitchen. He looks around in the kitchen. He's like, I have no idea why I said it. He just turns around, looks at his guys and goes, get out. Everybody get out. Run, run now. Does anyone smell anything smoky? <clears throat> oh my God. Uh, oh my God. Fire. Oh, fire. Oh my goodness. They, and they're trying to drag the hose out and he's like, drop the hose, leave the hose. And they're running. And they run out of the house, and basically as the last guy got out of the house, the entire floor caves in, falls into this basement that's this huge raging inferno in the basement, okay? They all would have been, it would have been a mass casualty, every one of them would have been dead. They grab the chief, and they're like, yo, man, what, how'd you make that call? What was going through your head? And right at the moment, he, he didn't know. He's like, I don't know, I can't tell you. I don't know, I got a bad gut feeling, and I got the hell out of there, and it saved a lot of lives. Long story short, he starts thinking about it, going through it in his head. He goes, you know what? I actually, there were some indicators there, okay? 
He walks in, he goes, it was a kitchen fire. Normally when you respond to a kitchen fire, you have fuel, gas, uh, grease, uh, plastics, all this gnarly stuff burning. So it's a loud fire, it's a crackly fire, it's energetic. You know, the, the, the smoke rolls in a certain way because it's coming off the fire. He gets into that kitchen and there was none of that. He goes, it was actually kind of a quiet fire compared. He goes, there was no grease popping or none of that. He goes, the smoke was rolling, but it was a slow roll, like it was billowing as opposed to being forceful. So all these factors he's taken in, but the biggest one he said was the sound. Again, a kitchen fire is usually loud and crackling, you know, energetic. He goes, it was, wasn't any of that. I, I, I couldn't hear any of this noise. And he just in his brain said, you know what? A plus B plus C. The last time we saw this stuff happen, bad things happen. So I'm gonna get the hell out of there. And he was able to save a lot of lives that day. So that's a version of fireman situation awareness that they have to maintain. And they have to take in a lot of factors. I got some friends of mine who were hot shots. And um, these guys would do crew these fires out here in California and the Pacific Northwest. These are, these are Looney Tune fires. These are thousands of acres. And I had a friend of mine telling me no problem that you have your crew chief and your squad, you might be digging a hole or whatever it is, the entire canopy above your head might be literally on fire. It's a burning inferno right above your head. And he has to look over at his chief, his boss, and his boss is taking in all these visual factors and his boss is calm and good to go. He's not you know, freaking out. He, just look, he doesn't look at the fire, he looks at his boss and goes, hey, boss is good, so I'm good. That's a huge amount of trust, huge amount of trust. And you, you only develop that in those situations through training and experience. So interesting. Firefighters that do a really interesting thing that I would love for law enforcement and military to take over. <laughs> Campfire. Military law enforcement does do the same thing. We do kind of hot washes and whatnot, but the firemen really take it to the next level in that where they'll go to a scene of a fire. Let's say it's a mass casualty fire where you had a lot of firemen die. If you remember, probably three, four years ago, uh, an entire hotshot crew died at one of the fires in Nevada, I believe. A fire had overtaken their position and then no one survived out of this. I think one guy, one guy in this entire squad survived. And um, that's the nature of the game. So what firemen will do, will take their firemen, their, their fire people, and they'll take them to that scene, physically on the ground, and they'll walk them through the scene. They'll walk through their decision making. They'll lay out what was happening in that scene at that time and go, all right, what's your decision? And the firemen will make a decision. And then they get to the next point and go, here's what you're seeing. What's it going to be? And the wild thing is the really learning, big learning point here, I'm a Star Trek fan, so I'm kind of going to get dorky with you all here, but if anybody has ever heard of a Kobayashi Maru, okay, the Kobayashi Maru test, I used to use this in the profiling with the military, it's the unwinnable test, okay, you don't know this going in, but this test, no matter what you do, you're going to get punched in the face and you're going to get beat up, and we do it as a learning lesson. So, we've managed to eliminate all enemy ships, no one on board was injured, and the successful rescue of the Kobayashi Maru crew is underway. How the hell did that kid beat your test? I do not know. That's what these things are. They'll have people telling them what you do in this situation. Hey, I would do this, I would do this. And you might have the exact textbook academy answer to deal with that situation. And the person running this event is like, all right, good, good job. Hey, good, great textbook answer. If you did that, you're all dead. You're all burnt and dead, okay? That's a, that's a big learning lesson to, to think that everything I've been trained, everything I could do everything right and still not come out on top. Yep, that's the world you live in. Okay, welcome aboard. So you tell me, do you think someone's going to go through an event like that and not take in information and not change their behavior and go, wow, I need to pay attention with this? So firemen got it going on when they, when they, when they have those Kobayashi Marus. But I think we can apply these in different areas in our life. So definitely a good side from the firemen. 
And then a, a third type of tracking is ground sign awareness, all right? This is kind of stuff I've been doing for a lot of years. I'm a tracking instructor, uh, was a tracking instructor for the Combat Hunter program, for our US military, and I still do some stuff nowadays. But ground sign awareness, just being aware of what's happening on the ground around you, right? Most 99% of the population, just like the behavior stuff I teach, we're not paying attention. You're not paying attention until someone takes your face and goes, look, there's information there. And you're like, oh my God, you know, and then once someone shows you what to look for, you can't unsee it, you know. And when it comes to ground sign awareness, there's tons of information. Uh, I had an old tracking buddy of mine, I must steal this quote from him. I'm sure he got it from somebody. But he goes, ground sign awareness, tracking, the ground is the most up-to-date newspaper in print. It's constantly being updated with the newest factual information right in front of your eyes. The ground does not lie. Dirt don't lie, we'd like to say in tracking. And there's so much people don't realize, you know, uh, uh, about what it can do for you. Not only can, yes, you follow someone like in a search and rescue type environment, help someone, or maybe the bad guys, maybe you're running down bad guys, but you, it teaches you to pay attention to small little indicators on the ground, a piece of grass that's been stepped on, a leaf that's been displaced. If someone steps on an anthill, anybody ever done that? Step on an anthill? What do the ants do? Hmm? Ants uh, move around by scent trail. That's how they find their food. So one ant will go out there and find a chunk of whatever, you know, abba zabba, and he'll walk back, and when he finds it, he'll lay that scent trail back to his colony and go, come on, boys, we're eating, and they follow that scent trail back. When you step on it and disrupt that scent trail, what do they do? They scatter. They're like blind. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know where to go. But what happens over, you know, a period, I don't know, five, ten minutes, what will start to happen after you leave, they'll go back to normal. They get back on the scent trail and go back. So if I'm following somebody and I see a freshly stepped anthill with like a half a boot print in it and these guys are all over the place scattered, do I have kind of a general reference of time? Yeah, I do. Is it is it an hour, two hours? I don't know. I can't I can't be like I can't like lick the ground and be like they were here 32 minutes ago. I don't know, but I can look at that ant hill and go, all right, someone was here recently. Okay, someone was here recently as opposed to a long time ago. Does that make a difference if I'm following somebody? Absolutely. So yeah, exactly. Granite, hey Michael, thank you. So I got Michael in the group, Granite Candy and Hot Shots. That's who they were. And Michael, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I believe it was Nevada. It happened in Nevada. It's it, it's been a while since I've seen it. Yeah, those were the Grand Canyon hot shots I was talking about. Um, it what so when you pay attention in ground sign awareness, when you pay attention to something that minuscule, a piece of grass, a twig, or whatever, guess what? You start paying attention to all these other things around you. All right, you start building what I call a detective's mindset. Okay. If I dinged you on the head and I turned you into like a homicide detective and I said, hey, you got to go process a scene. There's a homicide in there. And you're like, all right, I'm a detective. How do you walk into that scene? Do you like walk in there kicking stuff over like you roll the body over like, oh, what's going on here? And you start like poking around. No, no. Everyone stops and you clear that thing methodically. You have a process in your head that you use to clear it methodically. All right. You don't just wake up one day like, you know, freaking um, um, uh, an awesome detective, you have to build that. And tracking absolutely does that. It teaches you to get on the ground, see things from a different angle, and think from a different angle, right? So it's not only specifically what I'm seeing in the ground, okay? Like, for example, if you're ever in a search and rescue, and this isn't a hard rule, this is a good rule of thumb, if you're ever following somebody and they're lost and they, they need to get to you or you need to find them, I'll tell you this, if you're following somebody and you see someone start to discard articles of clothing, you're following, follow them, and you see pieces of clothing along that line. Let me tell you right now, you need to do something to speed up that track line. You need to find that person very quickly. Because at that point, what is happening is their brain's starting to boil. They're starting to get into fever. They're getting overwhelmed. And they're they're very close to death and of a very serious dehydration. They're, they're kind of getting incoherent, and that's why they're taking off their clothes. So you need to speed that up, all right? Just that little tidbit of information right there. So not only am I analyzing what I'm seeing on the ground, but I'm also applying it to my situation and getting in the head of my person I'm following. Oh my God, this is, I need to speed this up now, okay? Um, let's say you're following somebody and I got a tree right here in the middle. It's like a big canyon. Maybe we're out here in California. It's like an 80 degree day. And I walk up to where my people were going and I see that they sat down. I see butt prints. I see where they spit some water out. I see where their heels dug in. I go, okay, they sat right here. Cool. One, that can tell me, get me in the mindset of the people I'm following. How are they doing? Do they have water? Are they okay? You know, but also, so let's say if I got that tree right here and when I get there, the shadow of the tree is right here. 
but the butt print is over here like 30, 40 degrees offset, okay? Well, let's think about that. Remember, it's like an 80 degree day. I got a tree and I got shade right here, but I got butt prints over here. What's going on here? Did my quarry, did the people I'm following, did they just sit down on the hot part of that sun? No, we're lazy, lazy ass human beings. What do you think they did? They saw a tree and they go, it's hot day. That looks like some shade. I wanna go and sit in some of that shade, right? But what happened when you showed up? That was 15, 20 minutes ago, right? They've left. So what happened is that shade has shifted to where you are. But again, the cool side of that, you can like use a sundial effect on that. You can literally look at that and go, all right, how far has the shadow moved to this spot right here? And you can like do the little sundial math and go, bro, he was here like 17 minutes ago. Now you can get like that close. He was here 17 minutes ago. Now I have a time and distance gap. So you tell me, does that not build a detective's mindset? So not only did it teaches you all this stuff on the ground, but it teaches you to go to two or three steps further. Okay, so what, all right? If I'm standing on a big hill and I'm looking at a canyon and it's a warm day and it's a shady spot, shady spot, shady spot, and let's say this, this area I'm looking at, it might be two or three miles long, okay? I can't just pick my head up and go, oh, I, I don't know, there, you know, let's pick that direction and follow. Most people don't realize the information you're leaving on the ground in that every one of us has a certain profile when we walk around on the earth, our stride, our straddle, our pitch, our pressure, dwell time, all these little indicators that we walk around with, you can basically build a, a five point, six point profile on somebody. So everyone's stride length is a certain amount, 30, 32 inches, your straddle, your pitch angle of your feet. So I can sit there and follow you and I can fill out all these little indicators on you. And let's say I'm following you for a while. Let's say you want to trip me up as a, you know, an anti-tracker. You take your shoes off and you put on some new tracking shoes, some different ones. Hypothetically, I could take my little profile I built on you and how you walk. Even though you change the pattern of your shoe, I could still follow you, okay, based on that pitch angle and all those other things. It's like getting a fingerprint on someone. So this is why I wanted to finish off this live with my last thought here, a couple last thoughts. So one with ground sign awareness, I'm going to give you parents out there one little trick some of you guys have heard this trick come from me before but if you're parents of toddlers of you know one two three four year olds or mobile they can get away from you real quickly i'll ask you this question what do the bottom of your kids shoes look like do you know do you know what the pattern is okay most people out there don't know what the pattern is or the make of the, the shoes that they buy, they buy them they might see the outside color but what is the actual print on there, okay? So most of you will probably go and you're running your kid's room right now and grab all their shoes and go, what the heck is going on here? But here's the thing, I need you to take a step further. That's not gonna give you the best image if you ever have to follow your kid that's lost, that just looking at it or taking a picture is not gonna be the best thing. That's okay, you should do that. Look at it, get a visual, take a picture, put it in your phone. But here's an even better idea. Take your kid's shoes, what, how many pairs of them? and get yourself a piece of aluminum foil about yay big and get a piece for each uh, set of shoes and find a carpeted area put that tin foil down on the carpeted area nice and flat and take your kid make a game up i don't know what you can do tell him have him wear those shoes that he does and have him step lightly into that 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 uh, tin foil one by one one foot at a time make sure he doesn't churn his foot like that or he doesn't rock back and forth just gently put one down and slowly put his weight on it and back out and do it with the other foot too, okay? Why are we doing all this goofiness? Why? Because I'm messing with you and just to see if I can get you to do weird things on the weekend? No, because if I just look at a shoe or I take a picture of the bottom of the shoe, is that what I'm going to see on the ground? Baby tracks. No, it's not, okay? When you take a picture, what you're going to see on the ground, it's like a negative, right? It's the negative. So have that print in the um, aluminum foil. You can do this in your house. Now take a picture. Now that's a much more accurate representation of what you're going to see on your kid's shoes out there. So yes, you can do this in the ground. You can have them step in dirt and take a picture. But again, you can take that piece of aluminum foil, throw it in a book or whatever, take a picture and disseminate it. God God willing, you'll never need that. You'll never have to use that little trick in your, in your bag of tools. But I, I like to tell that to all my parents out there because... Um, that's really good stuff. If you want more kids and ground sign awareness stuff for my parents out there, uh, there's a great program to check out. It's a, it's a nonprofit. It's a very good charity. It's called the Hug a Tree Foundation. Hug a Tree Foundation. If, you, if you're active in your life and your kids are always running around, you take your kids out there, definitely take some time to look up the, the Hug a Tree Foundation. It basically, it's a class for kids to teach them how to not get lost in the wilderness. Just little ditties. Like Basically, the whole program is Hug a Tree. Get lost, Hug a Tree. You get into a problem, hug a tree, you know? 
because the underlying problem with children and getting lost when we have to find them, they're scared, uh, so they keep running away. And two, another really sad factor is a lot of these kids that get hurt or lost or killed, there's a factor in there that they think they're in trouble. You know what I mean? They think they're lost, they're in trouble, their, parent, their parents are looking at them to yell at them. And there have actually been really sad instances of where they were able to prove that a kid was running away from a search team. You know, where a search and rescue team was actually running them down and the kid thought he was scared and he's running away from them and he actually ended up passing away from dehydration and exposure. So the Hug a Tree Foundation comes in, basically teaches them whatever you do, don't move, find the nearest tree and hug it till, till an adult shows up. So definitely wanted to pass those on to you. So that's what I wanted to do this on this Friday, on this Aloha Friday. I hope I've given some of that aloha love to everybody, giving you some of the things to think about. But again, I'm the behavior guy. I'm on here talking about situational awareness, behavior profiling, how to find those pre-event indicators when you're walking around with your family. But I wanted to come in here on this Friday and just talk about the other types of it out there, okay? Because a lot of times, situational awareness might mean something completely different from you to you to you to you. Depending on your industry, your file folders, your background, you might have a different kind of understanding of what situational awareness is. So I just wanted to plug in a couple different industries and, and talk about them from there, all right? So I've come to my, my talky talk time. I know I got a few of you on here. I'm just going to kind of scroll around, make sure, see if I have any comments or anything, anything you guys want me to, uh, to get on before I get out of here. But honestly, I'm not seeing any comments. So if you guys are quiet, I'm going to go, uh, go ahead and enjoy the rest of my Aloha Friday. By all means, go ahead and drop a comment in here. There's all about 10 of you watching live right now. I'm going to be on here basically every Thursday. Tomorrow, today was Friday, but every Thursday at 12 o'clock, I'll be in here dropping some knowledge bombs on here. So if you'd like to chat, come on in. I promise you I don't bite. Uh, I don't bite very hard, so not a big deal. But besides that, aloha, everybody, and have yourselves a fantastic weekend.